Hello everyone, my name is Ray Johnston. I'm a STEM journalist and I'll be the facilitator for today's panel discussion, which is asking one year on from the Royal Commission into Natural Disasters, are we any safer? Now, the sovereign First Nations peoples of this continent have been passing down knowledge about land management since time began, despite all attempts to erase it. And as a Wiradjuri woman who was born and raised on Darug and Gundagata country, I am honoured to be living and working today on the unceded land of the Darug people. And I wish to pay my deepest respects to their elders past and present. And I would also like to extend that respect to any of my First Nations aunties and uncles brothers and sisters that are joining us today. And I ask that all of you watching acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that you're watching this from. Now, before we get started, let's go back to 2020 and examine where we were so we can ask, are we any safer today? Australians last summer bore witness close up to what the awful force of nature is capable of delivering right now. This was a force beyond our reckoning, and that is what we're here to analyse tonight. The challenges and the actions needed now. We would not be having this summit if global political leaders had started listening to the science on climate change and acting on the advice of scientists 40, 30 or even 20 years ago. It was an absolutely shocking summer. Um, but not a surprise. The resources that we have to put into emergency services must be greatly increased because we could have another year like this next year and if not next year, the year after or the year after that. I think we've got to not think about last summer as a one-off series of events. It's a warning for the future. We've wargamed multiple disasters with wargamed disasters happening concurrently. But the disasters that occurred last summer were fundamentally different. And so while Defence has been able to have good traction within its own department in acting upon climate change, the ability to take that message out of defence and become part of a broader national security deliberation has been limited. How limited? By and large, the last 10 years have been a barren field for government action on climate change. I know a lot of this country that's been burnt. It's been burnt the wrong way and it hasn't been managed properly for decades and centuries. We need to reach out to our Indigenous brothers and sisters because they've got knowledge that we pushed off to the side and they're, they're part of the solution if we let them be. For the third year in a row, California is a tinderbox. We have a hard time letting our firefighters go uh, to support our partners uh, in Australia and other countries when we're still in these extended and protracted fire seasons. So it's, it's definitely putting um, a strain or creating challenges on our ability to to share resources across the globe. I suspect um, Australia, at the very least, is going to have to invest a lot more to edit uh, some of its own aircraft. We, we do have aircraft, obviously, but uh, a lot of it goes around the world. I think that much more expenditure on that is going to be really, really important. A stern warning for the Prime Minister. We're here because of the continuing bushfire crisis and also because of the leadership vacuum in Canberra. You look at Greg Mullins, the emergency leaders, I think they've been enormously powerful to come out with such credibility and say this is happening, it's impacting us and we need to do far more. Well, it's been two years since I had a hose thrust into my pan into my hands, rather by my parents, when I went back home to the Wattle Creek fire front that you saw there at the beginning of the video, that big fireball there was only 100 metres from my parents' place. And Working together, we were fortunate enough to be able to create a safe haven for wildlife and protect countries surrounding their home, but many others weren't so lucky. And we're now a year on from the Royal Bushfire Commission. We're going to hear today what our communities need, what federal actions need to be pushed, and what we can do to build resilience against future climate catastrophes. Now, to do that, let me introduce you to our incredible panel, starting with Greg Mullins, who is the founding member of Emergency Leaders for Climate Action. He's an internationally recognised expert in responding to major bushfires and natural disasters. You saw him feature all throughout that package. 
and he's developed a keen interest in the linkages between climate change and extreme weather events. He coordinated responses to major natural disasters for over two decades and only retired as Commissioner of Fire and Rescue New South Wales in January 2017. So welcome, Greg, and thank you for joining us. I think you're on mute there, Greg. There we are. <laughs> we had to have someone be on mute and it was Greg to start with. Thanks so much for being here with us, Greg. Next, we have Professor Leslie Hughes, who is a distinguished professor of biology and pro-vice-chancellor of research integrity and development at Macquarie University. Her research is mainly focused on the impacts of climate change on species and ecosystems. Now, she's a former federal climate commissioner and former lead author in the IPCC's fourth and fifth assessment report, as well as a climate council director. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you. Hi, Ray. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Great to have you here. Next, we have Biami Williamson, who is a ULI man from Northwest New South Wales, who has familial ties to Northwest Queensland. He has postgraduate qualifications from the University of Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, the Native Nations Institute, University of Arizona, United States, and the University of Wollongong. He's a research associate and PhD candidate at the Centre for Aboriginal Economic Policy Research at ANU, and his research includes the impacts of disaster on Indigenous peoples. It's great to have you here. Welcome, Barmy. Yeah, I'm right. Lovely to see you again and lovely to be with everyone. Thank you. Now, Fiona Lee uh, rounds out our panel today and she's a coordinator of Gas Free Hunter Alliance, also an active member of Bushfire Survivors for Climate Action and an artist who lost her home in the 2019 bushfires. She did relocate to Newcastle after the fires where she now lives with her young family and is really motivated to prevent the curry curry gas plant from going ahead to help stop more people being impacted by the effects of climate change caused by the burning of fossil fuels. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you so much. It's good to be here. Now behind the scenes tonight, we do also have Nathan Hart, who is Climate Council's extreme weather and urgency campaigner, who will be able to answer questions submitted through the Q&A function throughout our discussion. So thank you, Nathan, there behind the scenes. Any questions, send them on through. Now, just two weeks after Australia agreed to the COP26 Glasgow Climate Pact, to move away from fossil fuels. The federal government has released a plan to drastically scale up polluting gas projects nationwide. Leslie, can you tell us a bit about how Australia is perceived internationally? Well, Ray, I think on climate action, Australia is perceived as a, as a global pariah. We went to the Paris climate talks with um, one of the weakest 2030 emissions reduction targets in the world. Uh, we haven't improved those. Um, we refused to sign up to a number of the pledges in Glasgow, including to transition away from fossil fuels and coal-fired power. Back home here, the, the Australia Institute has calculated that there are over a hundred fossil fuel projects in the pipeline. Um, awaiting further development. And as you said, um, the government has just released a plan to open up enormous gas basins. So basically everything that the government is doing is not just doing nothing, it's taking us further and further away from the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement and it's taking us further and further away from having a safe climate. Wow, now, Greg, are you able to give us a summary of what the states have achieved this year and if it's enough? Um, yes, thanks, Ray. Look, it, it's a stark contrast between the states and territories and the federal government. So each of the state and territories have far more ambitious targets for 2030 for a start, which was the whole point of COP26 in Glasgow, but Australia came with empty pockets and 
mind, I'll say it. Um, so the renewable energy zones, um, a lot of investment in renewables, charging stations for electric vehicles, ACT and New South Wales have got good policies to allow the uptake of um, electric vehicles, so reduce the cost. Um, and in the emergency services field, the states and territories are pri primarily responsible for response and they're, they're pouring resources in. So Victorian governments, 600 extra seasonal firefighters in forest fire management, Victoria. Um, this year, the New South Wales Rural Fire Services, upscaled aircraft, National Parks and Wildlife, my old agency, Fire and Rescue, unfortunately getting its budget constrained, but we won't go there. Um, but they look, they really are setting the pace on climate action while the federal government just looks on. So it's, you've got this bizarre situation of um, federal government internationally embarrassing us and putting my grandkids' future in jeopardy by not signing up and allowing countries like Russia and uh, China and India to get away with it because there's no moral authority to point the finger at them. Um, and it takes away the ability of other countries to point the finger at them and say, you need to lift it. Um, and the states and territories, Business Council of Australia, Australian Industry Group, they're all saying, let's lift it. This is good for business. New South Wales Treasurer has shown it's good for business. They can create good jobs. Uh, yeah. Electricity bills are cheaper. So it's there's a chasm between them. So states and territories, tick, but more can be done. Federal government, missing in action. Wow. Now, nearly 80% of Australians, it's a, it's a huge number, were affected either directly or indirectly by the Black Summer bushfires. And you know, lives and homes and livelihoods were tragically lost during this unprecedented event. Fiona, as a bushfire survivor, do you think that people are now afraid of summer in Australia? Yeah, unfortunately, I really do. I know I certainly am. And we've been given some reprieve over, you know, the last summer and this summer with double El Nino. Um, but that kind of only makes me more concerned given the growth of vegetation, um, the increasing uh, temperatures, and the fact that we know that more extreme weather events are coming down the line. And you know, I grew up on Virapai country on the mid coast of New South Wales, um, quite near to where I lost my house. And throughout my childhood, I, I certainly never had that fear um, yet of bushfires so extensively. But, you know, having lived through that extended drought um, and then losing my house to fire, I almost assume that it's inevitable that it will happen again. Like not only will I learn, lose my house again, but other members of our community will. Um, so yeah, I think that there is sort of a sense of foreboding that it's only a matter of time. And that's a really scary feeling to sit with. Absolutely. I can relate to that myself as well. First Nations people, we've cared for this country for millennia, but we are being disproportionately affected by climate change. Bami, can you talk about how the fires have impacted on First Nations trauma? Yeah, absolutely, Ray. So obviously by definitions of being Indigenous peoples, you know, as be being people from the land or, in, you know, people from a particular part of the land anyway. And so what we um, see is that when there's... Um, when there's destruction to country, including the resources of country, so including the plants, the animals, the birds, you know, fish species, aquatic species, all of this kind of thing, um, you know, and, and that's not just for the event itself, but it's for the long-term recovery of these landscapes. What you see is when you have the destruction of country, uh, in particular cultural heritage with, that exists within the country as well, um, it really damages the fabric of um, Aboriginal peoples, um, you know, cultural well-being of being together as communities and as groups of people, um, you know, who belong together and who belong to the land. Um, but in, in relation to the, um, to the bushfires themselves, like, uh, 
um, it wasn't just the bushfire that was particularly catastrophic and particularly traumatic. It was the, like, unfortunately, the unfortunate part of it and what we've learned since is that um, the damage to country was just kind of, it's a significant, it was a significant bearing and had a significant consequence for communities, but it also foregrounded another disaster that happened after that, and that was the response by, um, you know, government agencies and non-Indigenous organisations, non-government organisations entrusted to lead it. So we had Aboriginal people being really made to feel unwelcome at evacuation centres at relief centres and agencies and organisations that were reluctant to provide immediate relief to Aboriginal communities. And you can think about how exposed and how vulnerable Aboriginal people are in, an, in a situation like that, the incredible cultural trauma that they're going through, seeing their destruction to their country, and then they're rocking up and basically being made to feel unwelcome and like they have no place in the, you know, in the evacuation. So, you know, what we have now, unfortunately, is a, a trust deficit that exists between the relief and recovery agencies and organisations and Aboriginal communities who are invariably going to be impacted by these by these climate change driven disasters into the future and disproportionately into the future when you look at where people live in the landscape and Aboriginal people live in highly kind of, um, you know, hot, risk averse areas anyway. Um, so long term impacts are still being felt. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's difficult to imagine how to repair that in the long term or even in the short term, you know, what steps we need to take to repair those relationships to be able to rebuild that trust, but also just watching the land recover so slowly as well is, is a really difficult thing. Now, one thing that we have seen during times of crisis is, is the way that communities can come together. Now, Bami and Fiona as well, yeah, I, I would love to ask both of you about how communities are preparing now for the future. Bami, I'll stay with you. Yeah, sure. So I think um, the wonderful thing about Aboriginal communities and something that is a real strength of communities is the, the strength of our community controlled sector of the organisations, Aboriginal controlled organisations that service our community, You're talking about health organisations, housing organisations, and also you know, things like land councils and um, PVCs, uh, prescribed bodies, corporate native title organisations that represent the interests of Aboriginal community, uh, Aboriginal people living in sort of certain geographical areas, but also people with the cultural authority to talk about um, country, the management of country and the protection um, of cultural heritage and the enjoyment of country as well. Um, so we see a wonderful kind of kaleidoscope of Aboriginal community governing organisations right across the country. And like they're, they're just getting, getting on with business. They're getting on with what they do and they do it really, really well. Um, unfortunately, I don't think they've ever even had time to kind of stop and have a think and regroup and plan for the future because we went straight from the bushfires into COVID. And so these organisations have, you know, gone through one crisis, gone straight into another. So I don't think they've even had the time to, to stop, regroup, ask what happened to them and then make some plans and adjustments for the future. Um, and in saying that, I, I really feel like our organisations are so strong and they're so um, resilient um, and they're such they're woven into the fabric of communities. It's the the to me the the most important part is for the the work to be done on the government um, and the NGO side of the fence as well, making sure that their processes are are adept to to working with Aboriginal communities and to and to and to fulfilling their roles and responsibilities to help people who are going through disaster. So you know the the work we're getting on with business on this side, but the work needs to be done on the other side also. Absolutely. And Fiona, how have you seen? the communities come together and prepare for the future? Yeah, well, I guess I can only speak for the community where, you know, I was from, which was near Boban, which is north of Tare on the mid coast of New South Wales. Um, and what I've seen there is the communities take charge of disaster management the, themselves, um, acknowledging that they don't necessarily have the equipment to fight the fires, um, like, you know, 1920 or moving forward into the future. And we've seen, like I've seen our communities really rally and really take it on board, you know, setting up um, uh, control centre type of situations with the topographical maps and IBCs full of water and, and really taking on get ready days and, you know, fire preparation and being really proactive about that. And like, this is on a very practical level. So, you know, and, and phone reception, for example, and communications is a huge gap. Like the, where my house was, there was no phone reception. 
Um, and then most of the valley relies on uh, landlines, which just go out um, as soon as a, a tree falls over. So uh, the community is taken on board, setting up, um, uh, I don't know what they're called, mobile Wi-Fi transmitter sort of hubs at local community halls that enable uh, communities to be able to, um, you know, get in touch with services that are needed during those times. Um, and, and particular amenities and evacuation centres, um, and particularly around local halls. Um, and of course, securing water. Um, there's new tanks everywhere, um, new fire hydrants. And, but this is again, all on a practical level. <laughs> yeah. um, on, a, on a systems level, of course, we need to do much more than just to adapt to what's coming down the line. Um, and we all know that, but the communities are rallying because we've seen what this looks like. We've seen way too closely the impact that these devastating fires can have. And we just want to try and be as prepared as we can for the future. And probably at the same time, actively trying to get our governments to take more action on climate change because, you know, they, they go hand in hand, really. And I think a lot of people in the bush can see that all too clearly. Absolutely. That's, as you're describing that, it reminds me a lot. I spent some time living in North Queensland in my 20s in a very cyclone-prone area and the town was constantly prepared for those cyclones mm. to come through because it was something that would happen on such a regular basis and you would have that community you know, conversation happening and the place where you would go and everyone sharing equipment. And to see communities preparing for fires in the same way that we've historically prepared for cyclones is heartbreaking in a sense. You know, we, we shouldn't have to be doing this, mm. but we are. And I think that that is the strength of community, though. We don't leave anyone behind. We always prepare so that we can support each other in times of crisis, especially when you know the people in positions of power aren't picking up the slack where they need to be. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. <laughs> so around it was it was around twenty one percent of Australian temperate broadleaf and mixed forests as well that was burnt during the 2019-2020 fires. Leslie, what examples are there of life returning to these areas that were so heavily impacted? Well, it depends on what sort of life and, and where you are. So in, in eucalypt forests, eucalypt forests are, are very well adapted to fire and they most eucalypts tend to re-sprout pretty quickly. So you see the greening come back and, and that looks good. The, one of the problems though was with the absolute extent of these fires. So usually when you get a fire, things will colonise back in from unburnt regions. But when the extent of the burnt area is so large, then the distances that say seeds or birds or other animals have to travel to recolonise those burnt areas are enormous. So that of course slows down the recovery. The other one of the other problems was that we saw fires get into types of vegetation like the Gondwan and rainforests that are not adapted to fire, that are, that are there because they've been protected from fire. And those sorts of vegetation types do not recover, or at least not for hundreds of years from fire. So, you know, it really depends on what part of nature you're talking about. We, we saw an estimated 3 billion animals either killed or displaced. So another thing that happens is when you beat those populations down to very few survivors, of course, they're much more vulnerable to, to other things that go wrong um, and they take a long time to come back. I mean, there were a few good stories. So on Kangaroo Island, for example, which was absolutely devastated by fire and where there's a lot of endangered species that uh, people thought might have actually gone extinct during the fires. There has been some evidence of things like the King Island, uh, the sorry, Kangaroo Island done it actually being seen. But even if we see just one or two individuals, it doesn't mean that the population's coming back or that those species are safe. So, you know, what we saw over that Black Summer period was a lot of Australian biodiversity becoming closer to extinction 
even if they weren't completely wiped out then. Wow. And all those recovery efforts put in place to try to rehabilitate populations and, and care for the if the animals in particular, we saw a lot of emphasis on, on koalas and protecting koalas. And there was a, a real fear at a point in time that they may be facing extinction. Are there are any of those programs seeing positive results? Well, look, they are. And certainly with my WWF hat on, I can, I can say that um, WWF and, and other organisations like that mobilise very, very quickly with the support of the Australian people to save what they could. But, you know, we have to put this in context. Context: There were tens of thousands of koalas lost and, you know, maybe dozens saved. So even though we, we see on our TV screens at night, you know, nice stories of bandaged koalas being cared for, for every one of those animals, there's probably hundreds, if not thousands of animals that didn't make it to a hospital. So, um, you know, we, we lost a, a tremendous amount and the recovery because the, of the spatial extent of the fires and also the heat, the hotter the fire, um, the, the more difficult it is even for the tough old eucalypts to re-sprout and come back. And the, the, the deeper the temperature from the fire penetrates down into the soil, also that affects how many seeds are left that survive that can also re-sprout. So a really hot fire that occurs over a really broad, a really broad area, that's a lot more difficult to recover from than a cool fire in a small pack. The Royal Commission into Natural Disaster Arrangements Report re responding to that horrific 2019-2020 fire season it outlined 80 recommendations and more than half of them needed action from the federal government. We're now over a year on from this report being released. Greg, what recommendations have actually been implemented by the federal government? And I'm hoping you could also shed some light on why the federal government has stopped reporting on the implementation of these bushfire recommendations. Uh, well, so there were 80 recommendations, but um, I often say to people that recommendation 81 was the most important one. And in the body of the report, uh, the Royal Commission said, and all, this is almost word for word, um, the mid warming is locked in till mid-century, more warming is locked into a mid-century because of emissions already in the atmosphere and what will come between then and now. Um, what happens after that? is directly reliant on what we do about emissions today. And if we don't take urgent action, it will continue to warm. Um, but if we take urgent action now, it might eventually stabilise and then maybe in hundreds or thousands of years start to come down. They didn't say hundreds or thousands of years, that's me. And, but um, and I think that's what most scientists would say. Please nod, Leslie. So, yeah, yeah, good, thanks. Um, so look, what, what it boils down to, so 80 recommendations, they've taken action on probably about 14. None of them are closed off. They stopped reporting in June last year. I'd love to come to you with a conspiracy theory saying they're trying to cover up. I think it's just incompetence. It's rank incompetence. And they transferred responsibility from a um, Home Affairs Department to the new National Resilience and Recovery agency which can't spend money doesn't know how to spend money except on more employees and more executives so i they're just not reporting um as far as i'm concerned nothing's closed out back when they announced the royal commission it was just after a press conference there's a number of um the emergency leaders on there tonight i've seen um we held a press conference and said this government's taking no responsibility so we're going to hold a national summit. And so they must have had a focus group saying, gee, you better do something, Prime Minister. So they announced a Royal Commission. There was a strongly held view at that time that that was a cop out. And it, after that, it was, look, we can't comment on that because the Royal Commission will look into it. Look at other Royal Commissions called by the federal government who owns that, um, like the Banking Royal Commission. They set up a secretariat to track it and make sure that the recommendations are implemented. 
not this one. Um, nothing to see here, over, done and dusted. We've had COVID, we're in the floods and there's an election coming. Don't look there. Um, I think it's outrageous to say things like interoperable radio systems across borders is a state and territory responsibility for setting up a um, sovereign aerial firefighting case. There's another issue that I could go into detail, but um, so it's it's a fail grade. Um, we're tracking 10 recommendations that we see as crucial on our website and none of them have been implemented. So it's, uh, and look, hearing Fiona, Biami, um, Leslie, it's hard not to just go, this is too big. We can't allow that to happen. And Leslie taught me that actually at a very low point. We must have hope and we must take this into our own hands in a responsible and proper way that gets government to move. And it's too important. Um, it's too important to leave to incompetent people. And I think we've got an incompetent government at the moment. So there was a question asked about independence. Go to the independence. If you can't vote, um, coalition voters can't vote Labor, go for an, a good independent. But sorry, I'm getting very political. This is a political question, whether we like it or not, because our government is not taking any action. Absolutely. So how do we continue to put pressure on the government to actually drive and implement these recommendations? Um, you, look, get active. Uh, look at Fiona, you know, and I know some of the stuff Fiona's done. Um, getting stuck in writing letters, joining organisations. There's so many organisations now. There's Emergency Leaders for Climate Action, Farmers, Diplomats is a new one, um, talking to that group yesterday, um, security leaders, people who are concerned. It, it gets media attention and this government is all about spin and media and that embarrasses them and it actually makes them move. It, without that action, uh, they would have gone to COP26 saying, we're going to meet and beat our 20, 30 targets. And right, But no, they got a new slag and they said, we'll do it through technology, not taxes, and we'll, um, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it does make a difference. But there's elections coming up. Let your local members know that you are really, really worried about this and they must take action. The government was given almost $3 billion for the newly created National Disaster Resilience Agency, but the strategic direction doesn't mention climate change at all. Leslie, what can be done about this? How can we get climate change and climate action into the narrative and the strategic direction of that agency and your other like-minded government agencies as well? Well, I think the community gets it, Ray. I mean, the community gets the fact that things are not going to stay the same. They're going to get worse. So we're seeing with climate change increasing climatic extremes, increasing heat waves, increasing uh, bushfires, floods, drought, you name it. Um, they're all increasing both in frequency and, and severity. So actually acknowledging that we are on a trajectory that needs to be prepared for is absolutely critical. You know, it's extraordinary that that document, that so-called strategy, does not actually mention the major threat that everybody in Australia faces. So, uh, you know, I, I can't, well, I guess I can explain it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people in denial um, but until um, planning uh, takes into account the fact that we have to plan for an accelerating threat, we will not be prepared and we will not be any safer. Now, the government has long since promised money for resilience and adaptation, which is administered by the National Recovery and Resilience Ag Agency. But $600 million of the emergency response fund, it's sat in a bank account, earning $70 million in interest. Fiona, how could this money be used to protect communities in the future? 
Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so when I lost my house, there'd been a fire burning to the west of us for a number of weeks um, in a national park. It was started by lightning. Um, that, was, that was burning for weeks. Um, and we knew it was going to be a really bad season. We could see that fire coming. Um, and then it, it took so many houses. So, you know, putting effort into actually stopping the fires before they reach houses would be a really good start. Um, and I guess you need the services to be able to do that. Um, because, you know, in our little locality, there's a couple of fire trucks and a couple of locals. And when those fires came, there was no way that they could get everywhere they needed to be. There was no fire trucks in sight. You know, when our family decided to evacuate, there was no helicopters. Um, and in fact, because we had no reception, um, we were checking the fires near me app. Um, and in the crucial moments when we were looking surrounded by three emergency level fires, we were watching the fire and we knew when it disappeared off the map that at that time was it was really bad that I mean I don't necessarily expect real time information like that but there's just there's so many gaps in communications like we didn't get the text message that our house you know to shelter until it had probably already been burned down um and there's I mean so yeah, investment in local fire services to have more trucks and to be better prepared. Um, and then there's really practical things like, you know, families that don't necessarily have machines or access to machines to say clear their fire breaks. That's a huge job. So support in that kind of way would, I would have found useful for sure. Um, and then, you know, collaboration between services, um, you know, <laughs> probably funding Aboriginal fire practitioners and, you know, collaboration, more collaboration between national parks and the RFS. Um, and if we had more local uh, fireys on the ground, then that might have prevented some of the confusion that was caused by people coming um, from far away that had no idea of the local roads or the conditions or where the houses were um you know because bush roads and tracks they're hard to navigate and they don't necessarily line up with your gps um so that would have been really helpful and then you know being prepared for future disasters um you know more emergency and communications like i said before and education cam campaigns um uh, stuff like that and also like micro energy grids for when the power goes out, the power was out for a really long time up there. Um, and then battery storage and better shelters and sprinkler systems. Like there's so many ways that money could be, could be better spent. Rather than generating interest. Mm. Riami, where, where would you like to see the money spent? Anywhere. No, to be honest, like what there's, as Fiona said, like there's just so much, you know, and there's so much need for this stuff. Um, and, you know, there it's, it's just ridiculous that it seems to be tied up and, um, you know, unable or unwilling to find projects to support. I mean, um, you know, in, in one, of, one of the, what we've learned from the 2019-20, um, I spoke about the unique impacts and how Aboriginal people were made to feel unwelcome. Um, you know, Aboriginal people, discrete Aboriginal communities, right throughout the fire um, scour, um, throughout 2019 and 20, are just woefully ill prepared. They don't have communications. They live in overcrowded housing. They don't have safe evacuation points. They don't have safe um, access roads. They don't have enough uh, adequate transport, um, particularly for elderly and vulnerable people. I mean, these are all things that just require a bit of cash, you know, and then what you'll build is a system of discrete Aboriginal communities that are better prepared for a disaster so that the things that happened to them before don't happen to them in the same way and at the same level again. And more than that, um, you know, Fiona mentioned uh, Indigenous lead management programs. So um, that like, uh, so full disclosure, I'm a director of an organisation called Country Needs People. We're an organisation, environmental charity, dedicated purely to um, advocating for more funds to support 
Indigenous land and sea management programs, Aboriginal range of programs and Torres Strait Islander range of programs throughout Australia, constantly banging on the door of politicians, trying to get a bit of political will to spend some more money because there are more communities that want to do work and want to create their own range of programs and want to look after their country than there is money for. You know, you've got this wealth of knowledge, these integrated communities that are really well organised, that have the knowledge, they are ready to go. They just need a bit of injection of cash and a bit of certainty around that. You know, give them, just, just give it, just give it, just hand, just hand over. What you'll get for it is enormous. You know, what, a, what an investment into the resilience of the Australian landscape and to, you know, re regional remote kind of areas where there's a lot of job opportunities as well. So we're seeing how fantastic Aboriginal rangers can manage the country, let them manage it, manage it more. And the last thing I'll say, Ray, is that, you know, the money would be welcome, but it would be inadequate if we're just looking at the money. I think that there is a real conversation around the structural change, the, the legal changes in this country, you know, legislative changes that absolutely need to occur to realise the best potential for that money. Because at the moment, you know, uh, particularly in the southern areas of Australia, if you give Aboriginal people and uh, caring for country programs, range of programs funding, they're still very limited in what they are uh, or what they are able to do. So there's a huge case for re-regulation and, you know, put some of that money into, into a national inquiry to look at the re-regulation of protected areas throughout Australia, you know, to look at ushering in a new legislative regime across the country of um, real adaptive management, a legislative regime that fosters adaptive management, that fosters innovation, and that fosters the best possible land management practices to take us forward into an uncertain future. Federal government also announced $4 million to rent one large additional firefighting aircraft. Greg, is one additional aircraft enough to keep us safe? That makes two. In, in Australia all year round? So the answer is no, but it's, um, however, you get the law of diminishing returns and, you know, we've heard from the Army, Fiona, um, you actually can't get ahead of this, of how things are unfolding. It's so bad that no firefighting force in the world can deal with the worst years and the worst years are becoming more frequent and by 2040, on current warming, our black summer will be a normal summer, the, the heat and the dryness. And so we, we will likely see regular bushfire seasons like that. So the money has to go into community resilience and, and you can't actually adapt to this either. And this is why I keep coming back to that recommendation 81. We must drive down emissions and then have the moral authority to point the finger at other countries that aren't doing enough. And get on board with the countries who are actually taking action because we need to dial down the heat later on. It's a bit, I, I always use the analogy of a pot boiling over on the stove. You put lids on, put towels over it, fine. No, no, you turn, you turn the stove off, you turn down the heat and it'll stop boiling and going over. Um, so aircraft, they're not the panacea. We need more firepower, if you like, with these bigger fires. They don't put out fires, the aircraft, but they certainly give you a fighting chance on the ground. And I know um, when I was at Batemans Bay fighting fires on New Year's Eve, a um, whole lot of red stuff fell out of the sky and we all got covered in it. But thank God they came when they did because um, the flame front that was coming at us halved in size and we were able to deal with it and save a couple of houses. I lost dozens of others, but did our best. So. Um, the government just doesn't get this thing about a sovereign fleet. It's about having pilots, having ground infrastructure, businesses that support the capability. And we rely on Canada and the US, whose fire seasons now overlap with us. So when our early fire seasons start in August in New South Wales, guess what? California's burning and they won't let them go until November. So no, um, another fail grade. And I have to say, the fire services are being leaned on politically because they said in writing, you know, we need to own these aircraft. But when they rented another one, they said, oh, that's great. We think that's, um, that's met the recommendation of the Royal Commission. Um, hang on, they don't, that doesn't gel. What you said there, what you said there. So, and I know the pressure that we're under to make governments look good and pretend that they were doing the right thing when I was commissioner. So, wow. <laughs> no, fail. 
Fair enough. Now, the lands across Australia, they're really varied and they're unique and they've got differing care requirements. Barmy, in what ways do you think Indigenous knowledges can transform climate adaptation or emergency response or even how we think about resilience more generally? Yeah, thanks, Ray. And this is, a, I think, a really important question in the context of the discussions that we continue to have as a society, as a country, um, you know, particularly since 2019-20. So we see a lot of focus and a lot of attention put on Indigenous knowledges like you know, caring for country and, and I guess the, um, you know, the, um, the, the, one, the one particular practice that people are really interested in and it's got a lot of um, political interest and a lot of media interest is cultural burning. Um, a cultural burning is a wonderful practice and absolutely needs to be um, expanded more, needs to be supported more. Um, and also that kind of inter interagency and intercultural collaborations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. But it's not just cultural burning. Um, you know, cultural burning, if you look at the recommendations of the, of the Royal Commission, the, the, the independent inquiry in New South Wales, the formal um, position adopted by the Victorian government, cultural burning is just one practice in a suite of cultural land management practices. And it's that cultural land management, that holistic understanding that needs to be supported and understood and better integrated into management, you know, like, it's not a matter of coming up for, you know, um, rocking up to sort of certain plots 10 days a year and lighting some fires and walking away and saying, jobs well done, we did some cultural burns, fantastic. You know, what happens in the rest of the time directly impacts what, you know, the, the ability to burn and the, and, and, the, and the success of those burns as well. But other areas where Indigenous knowledges can transform people's understanding and approaches to these things. So we've seen a couple of examples through 2019-20 where uh, traditional owners, uh, you know, uh, representatives from native title bodies, um, particularly uh, Budge Bim in, um, in Western Victoria, and also Gari up in um, Fraser, what, what was formerly Fraser Island, Gari now, National Park. Two fires up there where local traditional custodians were brought into incident management teams and they helped, they provided critical information at critical points about the country, about sort of uh, populations, in, uh, populations of native and threatened species in the country, some of the cultural heritage. Some of the recent land management activities, some of the, you know, cl climate topography, like what our uh, previous fire history, all of this knowledge came into incident management teams. And then what happened was that those teams formulated new responses um, to respond to the fires. And both were just so successful. And you can look up that. You can look at Uncle Dennis's, um, you know, uh, testimony, extensive testimony to the Royal Commission. There's a, there's a Queensland um, Inspector General report on the Gary um, bushfire to talk about, you know, how traditional owners' knowledge was pivotal in formulating really effective responses to those emergencies. Um, and there are other kind of um, ways that Indigenous knowledges can transform uh, wider responses. Uh, and one that I come back to all the time is just the idea of national parks. Like an idea of national parks or protected areas, it comes from this, you know, this colonial myth of wilderness, right? Wilderness is a, is a construct. Wilderness is a myth. And um, you know, indigenous peoples live in the land and all over the world. You know, people and the place go together. There's not this kind of concept of wilderness, of a, of a landscape without people. No, people lived in the land and the land were cultural constructions of those people. And so you know, we really need to transcend this idea of protected areas and move beyond our current understanding, which is inherently colonial and which continues to, you know, the about is that wilderness just dispossesses Indigenous peoples of our, of our rightful place in country as well. So really moving beyond, you know, those kind of constructs that we have now, like I ask the question, what would a national park look like if it was written by and governed by Indigenous peoples? It would look nothing like they are now. And I think what you'd have is a much more adaptable, um, you know, land management program and the, and the, and the limits of possibilities would be, would be enormous. So you know, really thinking creatively, engaging Indigenous peoples and not just at that surface level, but deeply engaging and asking, how can I be transformed in a process of engagement? Absolutely. I'd like to see that happen in my lifetime, all those national parks being cared for and managed by Indigenous people, being the decision makers, the ones with the power in their own country. Oh, I've got some questions from the audience now. Uh, this next question, it's been submitted by audience member Raghu for Leslie. 
What key current technologies will be invaluable to minimise climate risks? Well, you know, as Greg said earlier, um, our government is fond of talking about technology, not taxes, as if um, it's the answer to everything. And technology is certainly important and technology is improving all the time, but it's not the answer to everything. Um, we already have fantastic renewable energy technology um, and we already have many, many other mechanisms to reduce emissions and to transition out of uh, fossil fuels to renewables. So that's the number one area of technology that we really already have. Um, we can't keep sort of delaying action in the hope that technology one day will, will get better or that uninvented technologies will be invented. So we've already got the means at our disposal from a practical perspective to actually make the transition that we need to make. Um, it's the political will that's lacking. Um, technology, however, is improving all the time. Things like solar panels are improving, electrical, electric vehicles are being developed and all sorts of other really amazing technologies. But the, our point is that um, it's what we do in this next decade that really counts. It's what we do in the next few years that's going to make a difference as to whether um, Australia is a livable continent from the point of perspective of bushfires or not. So while technology is important, we don't actually need new technology to really make a difference. Well said. I'm a big fan of technology myself, being a technology journalist, but I completely agree it's not the answer to everything. Now, Fiona, this question's been submitted by Rodney from our audience. Why has it taken so long to permanently rehouse those whose properties and houses were wiped out by the 2019-2020 fires? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a question that I get asked all the time, actually. Um, and of course, it's different for everyone. Um, so I think immediately, like people don't understand that it takes, like we need, we, after a massive disaster, we need time to rest and we need time to think and to reestablish ourselves and our identity, um, you know, get the things we need. And, and that in itself can just take a really long time. Um, and then, of course, there's been, since the 1920 fires, just rolling disasters. So, you know, where I was from, um, there was the drought and then the fires. And then by uh, we lost the house in November. And then by February, there were really bad floods. And then of course, straight after that, there was COVID. So all of those things mean that people are just constantly trying to, I really don't like this word, recover um, from the events that have gone previously. And there's so many reasons on top of that. Like, I'm gonna say the word renewal because I think that with the word um, recover, there's an expectation that people will, um, or there's the thought that, you, you like if you look at the word you actually cover something and just try and move on but I think for me I, I more am looking at a kind of renewal a, like a, a like a, a growth um, from that experience um, but that's a bit of a side um, but say for example clearing our house the government um, contractors uh, it took them eight months um, to get that done and I'm grateful that you know, that was able to happen. Um, but because of the floods and COVID, uh, that was, you know, quite the delay. And then other people that I've spoken to have issues with insurance. Um, there's a lack of tradespeople. Even if they wanted to get their houses built, they're having trouble finding people that can actually do it. Um, changing building codes, make it more expensive. Um, and then, you know, other survivors that I've spoken to, like we're always looking at where we live and rebuilds, if that's what we're able to do through this constant lens of risk. Um, but what materials are we using? Is this going to be safe for catastrophic fires of the future? Is there reliable access to water? Um, how are the fire trucks going to access it when the fires come? Um, so there's a lot of that sort of mental preparation um, on top of the practical um, aspects. Um, yeah, and yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess that answers it. 
Yeah, like, absolutely. It's you know, dealing. It's it's a trauma and it's a grief, and it's not something that goes away once you know you have your house rebuilt either. There's there's a huge emotional, physical, spiritual toll that you carry with mm-hmm. you while you are trying to literally rebuild your life. So the expectation that you can just bounce back is completely unrealistic, isn't it? Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. Got another question from the audience here. It's from David and David submitted a question for Greg. Now, given the imminent federal election, what key commitments on fire management should be sought from the major parties? Yeah, great question. Look, um, I'd be saying to every local member uh, to sign the pledge of the Emergency Leaders for Climate Action. And there's, uh, I think there's 10, we've got 10 climate action things that they need to commit to in that pledge. Um, They need to commit to implementing and coordinating the implementation and assisting the states and territories when necessary in implementation of all 80 recommendations of the Royal Commission. And I'd be saying match at the least the New South Wales Government 2030 target of uh, I think it's 50% reduction in emissions, which isn't enough, should be 75%, which the Greens have committed to, but at at the very least, um, let's meet what a Liberal government's doing, uh, committed to do in, in the biggest state. So, and look, I said before, people need to get active. But, um, I think we've seen with this government uh, that they really only address the squeaky wheel. They get out the oil can and address the squeaky wheel. Let's get really, really squeaky. They don't like um, noisy Australians, but let's all be naughty, noisy Australians and say we'd really like you to get on board to save our planet because it's really nice here. It used to be nicer and it's not your fault, but, hey, you're there, so you've got to deal with it now on our behalf. I love that. We've got to get squeaky. That's I'm going to take that with me from today's discussion. We've got another question here, and this comes from both Sue and Claire, and it's for Barmy. Now, how do we get parks and wildlife services to stop their one-size-fits-all hazard reduction burns? Yeah, um, good question. Uh, Greg could probably respond to this uh, uh, much better than I can, but look, I'll I'll give it a go to start the conversation. And I'll start the conversation by, you know, um, getting them to stop the one-size-fits-all hazard reduction burning. I think the opportunity lies in inverting that question. For what reason would they want to continue doing the same thing and expecting that they'll get a good result? You know, that's the opposite of adaptive management. Um, and the, well, quite frankly, the, the hazard reduction, the, the, the not the cultural, the, the hazard reduction, the um, land management practices entrusted to keep our natural assets safe, to safeguard many of our communities and townships, um, you know, by and large, for, for a lot of people, they would feel that, that it has been a failure, you know? Um, and we can't keep doing the, you know, that climate change is changing the game. And it's time that, you know, people really started to um, consider what our game plan is, because what we did before um, is not gonna work going forward. And Indigenous people would say, what was, has been done over the last 150 years hasn't been that flash either. Um, so, you know, that it's not, it's not, it it should not be us advocating for them to change. They should be changing. We should just be having that conversation. How do you feel about that, Greg? Look, I'm mindful of time, but I I look in fairness to national parks, they're, they're hopelessly under-resourced. Um, and it's great that a lot of ex forests have been transferred to national parks, but there hasn't been a commensurate increase in staffing. Um, I'd love to see dozens of, or more hundreds of Indigenous rangers employed and um, who are connected to country and who can start learning from people like the Army and 
the other groups and implementing those changes. But look, um, I have to say too in defence of parks, and I do a lot of hazard reduction in my RFS role as a group officer, but um, they're actually changing their practices and they're, um, in my area anyway, and it's a directive from above. Um, different burning practices, far more environmentally aware, but before they were being pushed by targets, and they just had to get it done. So the bureaucracy doesn't help. Um, but it's going to be all of us working together and listening and not being too bureaucratic. That's all the agencies, because that drives out people like Indigenous owners who understand country, drives them out, doesn't allow them in. So we've got one final question that I'd like to put to all of our panellists today. In a few words, yeah, we did come here today to answer, are we any safer? So what do we think? I'll start with you, Greg. Uh, look, I hate to say this because I said before you have to have hope, but um, strap in for the wild ride because it's getting worse from here. And we're in a La Nina last one, 2010-11, uh, then we had massive fires in the centre of Australia. We're going to have massive grass fires next summer, 22-23. Different kettle of fish, the forest fires, um, but major residential areas in New South Wales weren't hit by the fires at all. And, um, where most of the property damage has occurred in the past, they will be hit at some stage. The weather conditions are getting worse. So regardless of firefighting technologies, fuel reduction, resilience measures, um, fires like Black Summer are gonna become more frequent. And in between, there'll be bushfire seasons like our worst summers used to be. And some years, like we'll have little reprieves, a couple of years of La Nina, but because of that heat, and now cyclones will get worse, there'll be fewer of them, we'll get floods. Um, someone's just put up the CSIRO report, read that, 800% um, increase in area burnt in 32 years, directly related to climate change, making hazard reduction ineffective. And that's what my group's been trying to say. We were ridiculed by some sections of the media who've had an epiphany now, they believe in climate change. That's great, thanks Rupert. Um, so, Look, not enough has been done, but into the future, not enough can be done by human beings. We can't actually control this planet once we've poured poison into the air. So we must stop poisoning, uh, pouring poison into the air and bring those emissions down and try and get back to some something that we can manage. Leslie, are we any safer? No, we're not, and we won't be any safer until all governments around the world act, as Greta Thunberg said, like their house is on fire. Um, it's going to take a while to turn things around. In the meantime, we need to actually learn the deep lessons from the Black Summer bushfires, um, rather than thinking of it as a, as a one-off phenomenon. Uh, but we have to fix the root cause of the problem and we won't fix that until we really make the transition to a new way of producing energy and living our lives. So we're not safer, we won't be safer for some time, but hopefully um, with lessons learnt, our children might be safer if we try really hard. Yami, are we, are we any safer? <laughs> That's a very good question. That's a very interesting question coming from you, Ray, to me. Um, <laughs> in, in who's asking and who's responding to those questions. So, and in that spirit, I will say for, you know, there's a question of physical safety. And that's obviously, you know, what, what, what this question is for, but I'll just signal and respond to what it feels like as an Aboriginal person being in this country. You know, the question for me is cultural safety. Are Aboriginal people culturally safe to participate in society? Are people culturally safe to share their knowledges, especially around things like um, land management and cultural burning? Are they culturally safe um, in their own countries? I suggest not. Um, and I suggest we're a long way from that. And I think that the cultural safety of Aboriginal people and the physical safety of all Australians, they are two branches of the same tree and we need to have a discussion around the tree and we need to be digging up the ground and looking at the roots and just looking at the mould and the rock and the roots and kind of thinking really hard about how we repair the substance and the, what's feeding this tree and, um, you know, let's do that together. What a great, what a great way to, to, build a, to rebuild a country that's been devastated. 
Well said. Fiona, are we any safer? Uh, <laughs> it's, um, look, I can see members of my community on the chat there, one of whom is saying that her hubby and my friend is actually out there fighting fires after having 100 mils of rain. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing that. Um, no, no, I don't believe we are safer, um, generally knowing what's coming down the line. However, I've really thought about a way to end this on a, on a positive note. And what I've come to the conclusion is that communities, some communities, because we've experienced such horror and we've learned some lessons, perhaps we are slightly more prepared for what for the future. We can only hope. <laughs> now, I do want to thank all of our panellists who have joined us this evening to give their expert advice on these matters. It's uh, been an absolute pleasure to be able to speak with you, a real honour, so thank you so much. And I also want to thank our live audience for watching and also to those who submitted some excellent questions, seeing everyone in the chat as well, dropping all of your resources and experiences and joining in on the conversation. Thank you so much for coming along. Now, the Climate Council, it is a community funded organisation and these webinars wouldn't be possible without your support. So if you would like to contribute to the efforts of the Climate Council, there are links available in the chat to donate. Now, it's essential that the community does keep putting pressure on the decision makers to act. And that means to everyone that is listening tonight, continuing to be engaged in the discussion about the climate crisis and the action that needs to happen as a result of it as well. Uh, the Climate Council team, it's posting some resources in the chat now and by staying engaged through social media and also signing up to their email list, they will be able to keep you informed about how to take action on all of their latest campaigns, whether that's by contacting your MP, writing a letter to the editor, you're reading up on the latest science via their reports and videos and explainers or by donating to make sure that their work can continue. If you did miss a part of the session here today, a recording of the webinar will be emailed to you shortly along with all of the resources that have been posted in that comment section. Now, I do hope that you got a lot out of tonight's discussion. And we really do look forward to engaging with you all at the next community event. So thanks again, everyone, and good night. Thank you, everyone.